Okay, so I Can hope everyone's okay? still excited. Hi, everyone. Hi, 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 Alfred. Hi, Altan. Hi, so we will move on to the Hello, last everybody. session, last but not least, the uh, final session of the day. We're going to discuss specifically about ophthalmic anesthesia. We have three prominent speakers in this field. Uh, the first one is Dr. Alfred Chua from Australia. The second one is Professor Chandra Kumar from uh, UK. And last but not least is Dr. Ezat Assis from Egypt. And for this session, it will be led by Dr. Aida. Please, Dr. Aida. Okay, thank you, Krisha. Good afternoon, uh, everyone. Um, today, uh, we have the perioperative medicine three session. It is about uh, eye surgery, anesthesia for eye surgery. Just like Krisha say, that we have three distinguished speakers today with us. And without further ado, let us uh, start for our first speaker. Uh, this is Dr. Alfred Chua, Dr. Alfred Chua uh, from Australia. Dr. Alfred Chua will be talking about anesthetic consideration for strabismus surgery in children and adults. Uh, Dr. Uh, Alfred Chua has been very famous for uh, publication, of course, in eye surgery and other uh, field in anesthesia and had been known for so long uh, as a uh, as an uh, expert in eye anesthesia. So Alfred, uh, time is yours. I need to share my screen first. Yes, please. Um, can you see? Yes. Okay, I'll start Clear. now. I would like to thank Dr. Susilo and the organizing committee for inviting me to speak at into anesthesia again. My topic today is on anesthetic consideration for strabismus surgery in children and adults. I have no conflict of interest to declare. I will talk about the causes of strabismus, treatment and the anesthetic options and consideration during pre-op, intra-op and post-operative courses. My talk is mainly based on the recent publication of ours at Anesthesia and Intensive Care Journal. Each person had two eyes. Each eye was create a separate image. At the age of one month, we will learn to focus at the same spot. The brain then combined those two images into one single image, giving the three-dimensional depth. Visual development continued to occur during the first seven to eight years of life. Strabismus is a misalignment with one or both eyes. It results from imbalance in extraocular muscle functions. If this is uncorrected, the two separate images are transmitted to the brain. In children, the brain will suppress the image from the weaker eye resulting in amyopia. Strabismus occur in about three to 5% children worldwide and is therefore the most common eye surgery in children. Adults have a 4% lifetime risk of developing adult onset strabismus. It has various presentations. The eye can deviate inward, outward, upward or downward. It can affect one or both eyes. It can be intermittent or constant, large or small magnitude in the deviations. Symptoms generally include dipopia, loss of three-dimensional pictures, headache, inability or fatigue during reading, and myopia, and give a cosmetic uh, issues in this appearance. Risk factor includes prematurity, lower birth weight, smoking during pregnancy, family history, Down syndrome, cerebral palsy, or syndromes that have associated craniofacial dysostosis. 
the causes of strabismus can be divided into two groups, congenital or acquired. Congenital strabismus occur in the first six months of age, while acquired occur after six months of age. There's a whole list of causes that can uh, cause strabismus. In the majority of cases, the eye is normal. In terms of treatment, you can apply optical ACE. Prism will relieve the propia in small angle strabismus. Hatching of the eyes often improve amyopia. But none of this is going to correct the strabismus per se. Alternatively, you can inject pharmacological agent into the extraocular muscle or surgical correction. When botulinum toxin is injected into the overactive extraocular muscles, it paralyzes the muscle within two to four days. Its effect lasts up to three months, and during that time, it allows the weaker extraocular muscle to strengthen it. Local anesthetic bufivacaine, if it's injected into the weaker extraocular muscle, it leads to massive degeneration. The muscle start regenerating within two days. By about three weeks, it returned to the pre-injection size. Further regeneration continues and it will result in muscle hypertrophy. You can use these two agents either alone or in combination together. The risk of this technique include ptosis, electrogenic strabismus, perforation, retrobulbar hemorrhage, or intraocular injection. In cooperative adults, Botox or bufivacaine injection can be performed at with EMG guidance under topical anesthesia. The needle is inserted transconjunctival into the muscle or near the muscle. The patient is then asked to move the eye sideways and you listen to the auditory response of the amplifier. When the center of the muscle is reached, the amateur is the highest and there's cracking sounds audible. This can be performed in addition with uh, intravenous sedation if the patient is anxious. In all pediatric cases, they need to be done under general anesthesia. The medical equipment also can interfere with the EMG signals, plus the pediatric muscles are smaller. We find it very difficult to use a EMG guidance and we prefer to use surgical open exposure and directly inject it into the muscle under direct vision. Each surgical correction have a 60 to 80% chance of success. Therefore, repeat surgery is common. In conventional approach, you can do recession, resection, or transposition of the muscles. There are two other more recent approaches. Uh, one is adjustable suture. The other one is what they call minimally invasive procedure, such as mini tenotomy or mini pication. In adjustable suture strabismus surgery, is usually performed in two stages. In stage one, conventional strabismus surgery is performed with an adjustable suture knot tied under either general anesthesia or regional anesthetic block. The patient is then allowed to recover from the anesthetic effect. In stage two, the patient is awake, the eye alignment and the popia checked it, and the suture tension is adjusted to achieve the desirable outcomes. Stage two is performed under topical anesthesia. There is a possibility of performing this operation in a single stage if you perform all this under topical anesthesia. 
in minimally invasive procedures, only the center three to four millimeter portion of the muscle is operated on. You can either loosen it up or tighten it because the muscle is not detached. There's lesser manipulation of the muscle. This procedure ideally can be performed under topical anesthesia. You can also perform it under a block or general anesthesia. When should we perform corrective surgery on stress business in very young children? From the parent's perspective, the earlier the better because of cosmetic appearance. From the surgical perspective, early surgery improves sensory and motor outcome and there's no long-term adverse effects. General anesthetic is safe in very early age. In the guest studies, they compared hernia repair under general anesthetic and awake regional anesthetic at very young age. At five years, there's no difference in the neurological outcomes. In the sibling pair studies, more than 10,000 of sibling are paired. Those that have genuine anesthetic compared with those who hasn't got have genuine anesthetic, there's no difference in child development outcomes. The conclusion is the benefits of early surgery in large angle strabismus outweigh the risk of genuine anesthetic. So we should perform it as early as we can. In addition to the usual pre-op considerations, in children, pay particular attention to upper respiratory tract infection, prematurity, developmental delays, and congenital syndromes. Strabismus was once thought to be linked to malignant hyperthermia, but this is no longer the case nowadays. There are many syndromes that are associated with strabismus. If you have any one of these syndromes, pay particular attention to the cardiac and the airway abnormalities. Adult onset strabismus tend to peak at the eighth decade. Therefore, the patients are generally elderly. If it is related to thyroid eye disease, surgery on strabismus should be delayed until the patient is euthyroid and the thyroid eye disease is stable for at least six months. They may be on antithrombotic agent because of uh, strokes. They may have cardiac devices. In a survey among anesthetists, 96% don't order the pacemaker and 86% don't order the AICD settings during ophthalmic surgeries. And they report the no adverse incidents. However, given the proximity of those devices to the diaphermy, you may want to consider altering those settings. In terms of investigation, it should be tailored to individual patients' need. There are a few intraoperative considerations. Force duction test is when the surgeon grab the eye and move in different direction to see if there's any restrictive movements. The result may alter its surgical approach. If you use a symphonium, its effect on the extraocular muscle lasts four times longer than its effect on normal skeletal muscles. So you got to give it 20 minutes gap before they can perform this test and get a normal result. Some surgeons use topical vessel constrictor to reduce the bleeding. You should not do that with directly onto the raw surface of the tissue during surgery, or you shouldn't do that during incision in a pool of vessel constrictor, because increase of systemic absorption will lead to more incidents of systemic side effect, such as hypertension, arrhythmia, or pulmonary edema. Ocular manipulation 
in particular traction on the extraocular muscle can lead to oculocardiac reflex. It can be abolished with an anticholinergic agent. It is also reduced with a regional block. It has a lesser incident with volatile anesthetic than TIFA. And children are more prone to this reflex than adults. Traction of the extraocular muscle can also lead to more shallow breath and decreased respiratory rate, and therefore potentiate the effect of hypercarbia. This reflex is abolished again by a regional block. Routine antibiotic prophylactic is not uh, recommended. The incidence of infection in strepismus is about one in 1100 to 1900. General anesthetic is the technique of choice. It's suitable to most cases and all age, except the medical compromised patients. Maintenance of anesthesia with TIFA at the advantage of less post-opnose and vomiting less emergence agitation, but high incidence of oculocardiac reflex. The airway can be maintained with either a laryngeal mask, which is most of the case people use, or an endotracheal tube. If you elected to use a laryngeal mask, do make sure the airway is patent and you're happy before the surgery starts. Otherwise, you should change it to an endotracheal tube before the surgery commences. Because of the effect of hypercarbia with the general anesthetic and the ocular respiratory reflex, assisted or controlled ventilation are preferred over spontaneous ventilation. Most of the time, muscle relaxant is not required. If it is necessary, and non depolarizing muscle relaxant is the drug of choice. Regional anesthesia have the advantage of less post-opnose and vomiting, less emergence agitation, and less oculocardiac reflexes. And it also provides analgesia post-surgery. However, previous surgery scars and adhesion may interfere with the insertion of a subtenon block or the spread of the local anesthetic agents. Large volume local anesthetic may also interfere with adjustable suture operations, and you should not put a block in thyroid eye disease as the orbit is already congested with adipose tissue and mild fibroblasts. Many patients under regional anesthesia alone will experience some discomfort during the surgery, especially during traction of the muscle or disinsertion and reinsertion of the muscle. So therefore, it's only suitable for cooperative adult patients. However, a block can be used as a supplement to general anesthesia as well. In terms of post-op analgesia, a supplementary block on top of general anesthetic perform better than just the general anesthetic alone or general anesthetic with peptidine. In children, the group occupy relatively bigger space within the orbital cavity than an adult group. Therefore, the risk of a sharp needle injury is higher. Often in children, we just perform a subtenon block by the surgeon during the surgery when they open up the space surgically. Topical anesthesia alone is suitable for Botox injection, adjustable suture surgery, and minimally invasive surgery. For conventional strabismus surgery, is best suited for simple medial rectus and rectal rectus surgery. In other extraocular muscle surgery and revision surgery, is best avoided. 
pain and discomfort are common and therefore often sedation is required. This technique is only suitable for motivated and cooperative adult patients. There are few potential surgical complications that can happen during the surgery. Slip the muscle is when the muscle retract posteriorly within the muscle capsule. North muscle is when the muscle and the capsule both retract back posteriorly. Good perforation can occur during surgical um, suturing and cutting, and it can cause retinal detachment. All these complications may require you to convert topical or regional block into a general anesthesia. And with the group perforation, you may also need to treat it as light open group injury as well. The incidence of post-opnosis vomiting are especially high in children, up to 90% without anti prophylaxis while in adults, the incident is lower at about 30%. The current recommendation is for dual anti-emetic prophylaxis with ondansetron and desimetasone. Incidence of post opnosis vomiting is reduced by local anesthetic block, topical uh, local anesthetic, adequate hydration, and reduced opioid usage. Volatile anesthetic with a single and anti emetic comparing with TIFA have the same reduction in the incidence of post op nausea and vomiting. In terms of analgesia, non steroidal and OPI offer the same uh, pain relief. Topical local anesthetic alone is not sufficient. Um, regional block does reduce the incidence of post-op uh, nausea and vomiting and improve perioperative analgesia, but doesn't have a superior benefit over topical local anesthetic. Most of the people would use a multimodal analgesic approach with paracetamol, non-steroidal, topical, uh, minimum OPR usage, while whether you want to put a block in will be at the discretion of the team. Regular post-op analgesia for the next three days after surgery is useful as the patient often complain irritation of the eye from the sutures and surgical um, wounds. Part of the pain from strabismus surgery is because of the sutures on the conjunctival. Therefore, we have tried it using fibrin glue as the same that is used for pterygium uh, graft. And in our experience with small number of cases, the wound appear just the same, but the patient do appear to have lesser post-op uh, pain complaint it may be worth exploring. So in summary, early surgery is recommended for large scale strabismus in children, even at a very young age. Genuine anesthetic is the anesthetic technique of choice. It is suitable for all age group, complicated surgery, repeat surgery and bilateral surgery. Regional block have its advantage. It reduces ocular cardiac reflex and emergence agitation. It provides post-op analgesia, but it requires some patient cooperation. Topical anesthetic alone is used is quite limited. The current recommendation is for dual anti um, prophylaxis with ondansetron and dexamethasone for children. Analgesia will be by multimodal approach. Whether you put a supplementary regional block in will be at the discretion of the team. Thank you very much.
Thank you so much, Alfred, for a very nice presentation and a very informative and fruitful one. Uh, before we go to the discussion, uh, we continue to our second speaker. Uh, for second speaker is uh, Professor Chandra Kumar. Professor Chandra Kumar will uh, talk about anesthesia for cataract surgery in patient with uh, dementia the concerns and challenges. Uh, Professor Chandra Kumar uh, has been very known uh, as an expert in eye anesthesia. Also, he is, uh, he, is, uh, he, is he has been known for his publication in uh, eye anesthesia and also for other section in anesthesia. So uh, please, Professor Chandra Kumar, time is yours. Thank you, uh, 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 Ada, and thank you, Dr. Susilo and the team, particularly Eddie and Bumbang, for putting the ophthalmic anesthesia as a part of the session. It's a, I'm grateful for that. I have spoken about this subject before. That was about four or five years ago. Since then, something has changed. Now, obviously, you would know many of you, either you have anesthetized the patient with dementia or somebody in a close proximity that their family might be suffering from dementia. So it's a very emotive issue. So what I would like to do is that although it is anesthesia for cataract surgery in patients with dementia, but what I'm going to say will apply mostly to your everyday practice. So you can change and see how you can, uh, uh, you can do the technique for the people. Okay. Can you hear me all right? Yes, uh, clear. Oh, thank you very much. So there is no financial interest. I am not an expert in dementia, but I do provide anesthesia for patients with dementia, something like six to eight weeks per week. And I am interested in anesthesia for the elderly and ophthalmology. And what I forgot that now I have left Singapore, I've come back to UK, so that may not be the case. But nevertheless, I do have that experience. So these are the, some of the books I have done, all the publications I have done on the elderly. And these are some of the ophthalmic books. Uh, some of you might have seen them. With that, let's look at what is dementia. So dementia usually affects elderly. Usually, it can happen in a younger patient too. Cataract and dementia may coexist in the elderly and both can impair vision. And we'll talk about it a bit later. So cataract surgery in patients with uh, uh, in a dementia, usually surgeon will list that under general anesthesia. When you look at the literature, there is hardly any literature on anesthesia for cataract surgery. You may have some literature in general surgery and so on. There are some guidance on perioperative care of a patient with dementia, but doesn't say anything about ophthalmic anesthesia. So what I'm going to do, I will cover the subject and then I will make some reference to ophthalmic anesthesia. This is one of the paper published by ophthalmologists. They talk about the challenges of cataract surgeon. And that's why when you look at some of the challenges, that's why they put the patient on uh, under general anesthesia. This is the editorial we wrote with Dr. Prof. Edwin C. from Singapore in BJA. And we covered a lot of things into that editorial. Later on, we had some data to publish. Uh, related to cataract surgery, and that's where the publications are, and we'll talk about some data about the uh, dementia and cataract. This is the guideline I was talking to you. This is published by Anesthesia, by the AAGBI, and you can see there are a lot of um, uh, uh, authors in there, but when they talk about these guidelines, these are generic guidelines, okay? There is no mention of anesthesia for cataract surgery. So, I'm going to talk on how we are going to do this, this divide this subject. So I've got mainly four headings. We'll look at how the dementia is affecting and what dementia is. Then we look at what are the concerns of the ophthalmologist or what are the concerns of the anesthetist. Of course, as the anesthetist, we will be doing the assessment, preparing the patient, and we will look at the effect of surgery and general anesthesia and dementia. We'll think whether we can do some regional anesthesia in that, and then I will conclude. So in terms of dementia, 
the definition would be very important. It is a group of symptoms with slow and progressive loss of cognitive function. So this is a progressive. The important word here is progressive. That means it doesn't improve unless you have some sort of a newer active treatment going on. And these losses, symptoms, are or exceed the normal age-related decline. We all know, I'm getting older, I've got a bit of a loss of memory, but it's not progressive. So we do tend to forget where the keys are, what letters, what the job I have to do, but that's not dementia. There is another important factor for calling dementia would be that the impairment of a cognitive function sufficient to interfere social or occupational functioning. So just forgetting is not just good. Then it starts to affect the a cognitive function, maybe thinking, maybe doing something, uh, returning home and so on. We'll look at it a bit later. If you look at the general population of the world, in 2015, it was 7.5 million. How about Indonesia? You had a 254.8 million. In, in anticipated population in 2050, is going to be 9.5 billion worldwide. But your population in Indonesia is going to be 290 million. And as you can see the graph on the right hand side, the graph tends to go down. So there, is, there are some projections that in Indonesia, the population might decline in 2050. Let's look at the patient with dementia. The worldwide, 2015 had a 50 million. By 2050, it's going to be 152 million. How about in Indonesia? In 2015, you had 1.2 million people suffer from dementia, but in 2050, it's going to be roughly about more than three-fold. It's going to be 3.98 million. So now you can see you have got a problem too. The dementia is not just one. There are a whole lot of uh, diseases come under the dementia, but the commonest one is the Alzheimer's disease or AD which is more than 60%. The causes are unknown, but there is a progressive cell damage. We'll talk about it a bit later in detail. But there are other types of dementia, such as the vascular or mixed dementia, and there are other dementia such as associated with Parkinson's disease, you know, CJD, disease, Lewy body, and so on. But in terms of anesthesia, we mostly know about the Alzheimer's disease. So you can apply the same principle of anesthesia, whatever, into other type of dementia. So let's look at what happens in, in Alzheimer's disease. There are two things happening. One, there is a plaque formation. And the plaque is extracellular deposit of protein fragment called beta amyloid. Okay, that's extracellular. That's on the right hand side. Okay, the top one. Then there is another problem, which is called tangles, but these are intracellular accumulation of twisted strands of protein. So in terms of two things, just don't remember the name, say there are changes inside the cell and there are changes outside the cell. And those changes are progressive. And so what happens at the end? There are neurodegeneration and cortical thinning and symptoms start to appear. So how does uh, dementia manifest? As I mentioned earlier, simple forgetfulness in seniors is not dementia. Where are my keys? Where are my letters? What did I forget? Oh, I did have to write a letter or something, but that will come back. So simple forgetfulness is not dementia. So what is the features of dementia then? There are loss of sense of time, date, familiar places. So person doesn't know what day today is. And they start to progressively lose those functions. Forget routine tasks, such as have you had a dinner or going to the washroom or toilet? They tend to forget that. Then later on, as the disease progresses, the person becomes depressed. They could be restless. They could be very irritable. The communication is impaired. They can't think. They can't decide. And there are 
numerous method of assessment for dementia and we will briefly touch upon that later. But there is one the, the uh, assessment tool I found it very useful is called Riceberg Scale. And as you can see in the reference, it's 1982. There are, as I mentioned, there are various tools, but what we want is in the clinic, in the outpatient, where you can quickly assess what is the stage of dementia. And according to Riceberg, there are seven stages. Stage one, there is no cognitive decline. Okay, that's a, that's a normal one. So the person is functioning normal. But as you progress and go into a stage four, then there is a difficulty in concentrating, memory loss of, uh, 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 memory loss of recent events, trouble completing complex tasks and returning home. So the person goes out and doesn't come back home. I may come back after two hours, three hours. And that kind of person will start socially withdrawing, and then as the disease progresses further, then that would be stage seven. There is no communication, required assistance with most of the activities like going to the toilet, loss of psychomotor skills, they can't walk even. So you can see how the patient is going to be disabled with this particular serious disease, Parkinson. Now, so what do I do in my clinical sense? I'll go and talk to the patient and get my uh, staging done quickly. I'll ask, what's your name? If the person said, my name is so-and-so. I would not be asking date of birth, but I may ask, which year were you born? Or how old are you? And the third question would be, where do you live? And if all these three answer questions are not good answerable, then I might have to decide saying, oh, this patient will need general anesthesia and so on. So that's the one of the assessment I do very quickly on the ward. So now you've got a patient or patient worldwide. Uh, what is the burden of dementia or how it's going to affect us? There is no known established preventive measures and treatment. If we did, then the patient would have improved by then. But there are some, some treatment in the pipeline, but not well established. Now people are living longer. And as the people are living longer, you will have a higher incidence of dementia. Overall, workload in the medical will increase, so the cost will go up, and there would be health requirement would be increased, including surgery and anesthesia. And there we come in. If the surgeon will list the patient for dementia, surgery in patients with dementia, we have to anesthetize them. So in terms of their ophthalmology, what are the ophthalmologists worried about? And I mentioned this paper earlier, the challenges of the cataract surgeon. And the ophthalmologist view are recorded in this one, and there are diverging opinions. So let's go some of them. Some surgeons will say, I find it very difficult to justify cataract surgery in severe dementia. The other will say, I lack of understanding of GA, cooperation, communications, I want GA. The other will say, to avoid the risk of patients sitting up halfway through the surgery, under local, I would prefer a GA. But there are other group of ophthalmologists. They will say, hey, I don't know much about GA. Surely it doesn't help. And there are comorbidity. The other, other ophthalmologists will say, there is much more involved in administering GA. So these, ophthalmolo these ophthalmologists are worried. Then the other person will say, I administer retrobulbar block for these patients. Some will say, I do subtenone block. Some will say, I even prefer topical anesthesia. So you can see the range from general anesthesia to topical anesthesia. But what they do know, ophthalmologists, that differentiation of a visual impairment from cataract and or dementia is very difficult. So if the person is, has got a visual impairment, an aging patient, it's very difficult to decide whether dementia is causing the problem or cataract. Cataract can happen, but doesn't necessarily mean the vision would be completely impaired. It's very difficult. The ophthalmologists also know that the impaired vision is associated with reduced cognition. If the patient cannot see very well, tend to have a lower cognition. And one thing they also know, that a cataract surgery reduces cognitive decline in patients with impaired cognition. So at the end of the day, 
you have to think, saying, okay, the patient has got dementia, can we do something for them? And this was a recent paper published in I, and they came out with a recommendation, or recent view call it, saying surgery should be considered sooner rather than later. So don't delay it because dementia is going to get worse. Then plan surgery and anesthesia after discussion with the relative or caregiver in the best interest of the patient, not in the best interest of surgeon or anesthetist. Okay, we have to think about it. And sometimes you do have to say and consider saying, if this patient is dementia, I'm going to give general anesthetic, let's do it bilateral surgery if possible. Generally, bilateral surgery in ophthalmology is not recommended. Okay, so that were the, those were the concerns of the ophthalmologist. Let's look at what are the concerns of anesthetic. Of course, we have got to prepare, assess and prepare. And we'll have to look at the general versus local anesthesia. So in terms of the concerns and challenges for anesthetists is assessment and preparation. So what's happening with these patients? You have got two problems. One, the patient is elderly. The second problem is the patient has dementia or getting into dementia stages. So elderly and dementia. Then the second problem is the patient is aging. Their pharmacokinetics and pharmacodynamics would be altered. And there are several other major issues which we'll briefly talk. So in terms of the pathophysiological changes, let's look at the brain first. This is normally happens in elderly. 20% reduction in the cerebral blood flow. There is also increasingly vertebrobacillar insufficiency. Also with the aging, there is a neuronal and cell damage with the aging. We know that. And 70, about one third of these patients above 65 years old do suffer some cognitive impairment. It doesn't mean dementia, but there are some cognitive impairment. And 33% of the patient who are particularly suffer from de depression. And as we mentioned earlier about the pathological changes in Alzheimer's disease, that is extracellular and intracellular cell damage. In terms of the other systems, such as respiratory, you are all aware with the aging, there would be loss of the tissue, reduced lung capacity, and so on and so on, and there would be a VQ mismatch. Cardiovascularly, the aging patient will have the stiff heart, they may have a high blood pressure, and there are altered sympathetic response. You are all aware of that. In terms of the kidney, they do have loss of the renal tissue, the GFR decreases, and tubular excretion and reabsorptions are affected. And similarly, liver tissues, they have loss of, uh, loss of tissues in the liver. Metabolic, usually patients may become diabetic later on, there is a higher incident in elderly, and of course the musculoskeletal arthritis and poor mobility, and all these are related to prolonged recovery. In terms of the pharmacokinetic and pharmacodynamics, you heard that the liver is, dam liver is, is, is function reduced, and so is the kidney. So what happens then? The oral drugs, whatever you're giving, they get absorbed slowly. The gastric emptying is delayed. The distribution of drug is affected so because of the altered protein binding and so on. Of course, the liver tissues are you know, not there very much. So there is a decreased breakdown and hepatic clearance. And similarly, the kidney would not be able to excrete normal. So there are the problems. In terms of the other major issues in these patients with the dementia, of course, the history may be inadequate because the patient is not going to tell you what you are going to get it from the patient relative or the carer. The patient may be taking a lot of medication which may interact with the anesthetic agent. The optimization may not be possible. May have written, may be possible, may not be possible. And of course, you have to assess the cognition and, and frailty and of course the consent issue. We talked about the cognitive assessment, as I said to you, there are hundreds of the uh, tools available, but one we talked about more was the written in the green, that is the GDS, that is a global deterioration scale, and this is, I found, we found, most practical, the Reisenberg scale, which I mentioned earlier. 
There are a lot of data recently about the frailty, and I'm sure you know about it, and there were some reference, uh, some lectures in the recent one, that frailty, when the patient gets older, patient becomes frail. So what is a frailty? Often defined as a symptom of physiological decline in the late life. And 20% of these patients, over 70 years old, they do suffer frail, they are frail. There are lots of frailty tools, Edmonton tools and, and Vancouver tools and whatnot, but you find one of the tools which are good for you. Most dementia patients are frail, there is no doubt about that, because they do, not, they do have an increased physiological decline. And one thing we also know from the, from the, from the literature, that if the high frailty score predicts post-operative complication, delirium, increased length of stay, delayed discharge, and so on. So that's what the problems are. And of course, the consent, the patient cannot give you the consent. So they will be all, whatever, you know, mental capacity act you have in your country, you apply that. Of course, you will be talking to the relative or the carer about the pros and cons of local and general and local anesthesia. And of course, you give as much as possible to the carer or the relative uh, but the but, and, 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 and you have to take the consideration of the patients and the relative and the carer. Then we have to look at what are the adverse effects of surgery and GA. And in this term, what we do know is this one, that this um, uh, is called the, uh, this is called Cambridge. It's called Cambridge, you know, Cambridge, um, cognitive decline uh, score. And this is done as a uh, 130 to 100. So if somebody had got a 100 score, there is a complicated tool. So you calculate that score. If it is 100, that person is supposed to be normal. No cognitive decline. And in these patients, whether you do surgery or you don't do surgery, there is not much of decline. But if that red line where the number is 80, that's a cognitive decline. And if you do surgery and they don't do the surgery, let's look at what happens. If you do not do surgery, there would be a decline. But if you do the surgery, which is indicated by the red arrow, red graph, a decline is much faster. That's very well known. But these figures are from other surgery, not cataract. So this may not apply to gen general anesthesia for cataract surgery. Okay, let's look at what are the other concerns. There are lots of papers in general, newspapers, television, these are coming. The dementia risk may be higher for older people who have general anesthetic. So the people are aware of these things. They will be asking you questions. And, and uh, we do get this problem in the clinic saying, hey, can you, can you not give general anesthesia? Can you do it under local? So, of course, you have to justify that and tell them what you want. And there are also literature is telling you, should general anesthesia be avoided in the elderly? Dementia risk may be higher for older people who have general anesthetic. General anesthetic and the risk of dementia in elderly patients, current insight. So there are scientific as well as public cry saying general anesthesia is bad for the, the dementia patients. So we looked at the concerns of dementia in terms of the anesthesia. This one, some papers are saying there are problems. Some papers are saying there isn't a problem. So these are evidence of no association, but it's not very clear. But equally, there are other papers which are suggesting general anesthesia. These, these are all heavily referenced for you. There is an increased risk, appears to accelerate uh, dementia associated with subtle decline. So there is evidence of worsening, but again, not very clear. So I'm, I'm leaving you confused whether general anesthesia is good or bad. I leave it to your judgment that if there is uh, uh, some uh, you know, evidence that it might be bad, you might have to think that way, but, 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 but we will be guided by the literature. If general anesthesia is bad, are supposed to be bad, is it the volatile agent versus more? There is some evidence in the, in the uh, animal model, yes, it can, it can. But 
Is Tiva better than inhalation? Now, again, there is fewer uh, uh, people experience post-operative de cognitive decline if you do have a total intravenous anesthesia. But but there is no very much a hard data on it. This is a Cochrane study which said they do have a less uh, cognitive decline. So you might be thinking, should I do Tiva? But then your question is, if you are doing Cataract surgery, which is 20 minute, 15 minute operation. Do you want to go for that kind of a thing? The judgment is, of course, up to you. But patient is a patient. You don't want to do any harm. Then there's another problem. Problem is we know that if you give general anesthesia to people, particularly elderly, there are some terminology which we are aware of. The first one is the emergence delirium. The many patients, in your experience, my experience, we have all seen that. Some patients wake up and they don't know where they are. But this is called emergence delirium, which happens within a couple of hours of surgery. But when the cognition is affected over days, then it is called post-operative delirium, or POD, post-operative delirium. And if the cognitive decline is longer, weeks and months, then it is called post-operative cognitive decline, that is POCD. We are all aware of this. But when you got a patient who had already got cognitive decline to start with, it's a very difficult to differentiate what is happening to these patients. Okay. So let's look at briefly what is a post-operative delirium. Post-operative delirium is acute and it's a fluctuating alteration of mental state of reduced awareness and disturbance of attention. So it happens, okay? And 36 to 50% cognitive impaired patient, elderly who have got a, already got mild cognitive impairment, they become more affected, particularly frail and those who are receiving multiple drugs. They develop more POAD and usually occurs on the fifth day. As I said, this is, you know, occurs over the day, not hours, and may last even longer. And POD is, many papers are saying it accelerates dementia. So let's look at some of the evidence. Is there any? Does POCD accelerate dementia? Yes, some say insufficient data to suggest that surgery and anesthesia accelerate dementia, okay? Unlikely. So these are the two papers, the recent one I have included. If I make a list of long list, you will have more papers. So there is evidence of no association, but unclear. Put it this way. There is no clear evidence of association, but it remains unclear. How about the bad one? That does it accelerate? Yes, there are papers to say, yes, it is a risk, particularly in patients who are mildly cognitive impaired already. That means if there is an onset of dementia or some impairment, these patients are more at risk. Okay? So these are the two papers I suggested to you. Okay? There, there is evidence of worsening. How about the post-operative cognitive decline? This is defined, the post-operative cognitive decline, POCD, I'm sure you are all aware that you cannot call a post-operative cognitive decline unless you have done a battery of tests before and a battery of tests after. And the POCD is defined as a drop in cognitive function, memory, learning, or concentration. And this has to be done by a neuropsychological confirmatory test. If you haven't done the test, you cannot call it a post-operative cognitive dysfunction. And this POCD is much more commoner after non-cardiac and cardiac. You know, there's a difference between non-cardiac and cardiac. But what we don't have any knowledge about what is the post-operative cognitive decline after cataract surgery. But usually it starts after a few weeks and lasts for months. Then the question should be is being asked, does POCD worsen dementia? And some will say it does, or some would say it doesn't. So there is no clear link between POCD and dementia. Equally, on the other hand, there are some saying, yes, GA increases the risk of POCD. There are other POCD produced changes like Alzheimer's disease in the brain. So again, the evidence is conflicting. Okay. So why the evidence is so inconclusive? 
because the data are from non-ophthalmic population and may not be applied for relevant to GA and cataract surgery. There are varying terminology, and I'll come back to that in a minute. There are terminologies varying, methodology have varied, there are no randomized control tried, so there was a need for uniformity. And there were conflicting results on the effect of GA, POD, and POCD. We heard about that, that general anesthesia decreases it, doesn't decrease it, post-operative delirium makes it worse, it doesn't make it worse, the POCD makes it worse, it doesn't make it, so it has been conflicting evidence. So there was a need for universal terminology. Um, okay. And these are the six, the art, six journals they published exactly the same article, and I don't know how it was, but these were done by a very well-known um, the authors, and they suggested that we have to have a consensus on the universal terminology. If we don't have a consensus on terminology, we are going to get into the same problem that we would may not have. And the article was published in all the journals, including uh, anesthesia, analgesia, and Canadian Journal of Anesthesia, uh, 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 and as well as BJA. Okay. So what then? I'm, I'm sorry, Prof. Uh, four minutes left. Four How many? Minutes. Four How many? minutes. Four okay, okay. minutes. Okay, okay, okay. So they said they have to have a terminology called neurocognitive disorder or post-operative delirium and post-operative neurocognitive disorder. So they have gone done away with the POCD. So what about then the regional anesthesia then? Why would you like to do regional anesthesia? Of course, we know all the advantages that a few related, you know, comorbidities are less, POCD would be less, POD would be less, minimum post of nausea, vomiting, early ambulation, and early return to life. These are the advantages. And these actually, some of the recommendations come from the published literature that try to avoid general anesthesia if you can. Go for regional anesthesia. So this is the data we, we did the study in Singapore that we had some patient and we applied the rule of the global deterioration scale which I talked about, the Reisenberg, and we found that we managed to reduce the, uh, reduce the incidence of uh, uh, the use of GA and the RA increased from 44 to 64%, but did not use any sedation. And unfortunately, in the study period, we had to convert to regional anesthesia to GA. We do have to do some extra measures during if you are going to go for uh, uh, RA or local, then assess the cognitive name and proceed with subtenone because this will give you an idea whether the patient is going to tolerate. Needle block, you can just put, put, put one in, but subtenone, you do need cooperation of the patient. Hand holding will help, and sometimes you find you restrain the head uh, with the tape. So what we can say in the conclusion, this is the most recent paper, again, I have looked at it, and what that paper says, the paper says there is no conclusive evidence whether the GA is bad, type of anesthesia doesn't make very much of difference, whether it's a RA or GA, but the tendency to go for RA if possible. Type of agent, if you go for GA, TVA is better, but there is no conclusive evidence. And the last one, it said, it's a superior for patient with the, with the dementia. So TY is better. So in conclusion, I can say to you that cataract surgery in patients with dementia will be more common as we, we age and, you know, in the years to come. The cognitive decline after GA remains controversial in the patient with dementia. There are stages of dementia, so all patients with dementia are not similar. And GDS-based, that is the global deterioration scale-based, assessment give you some idea whether you can go for a local or a GA and of course the further research is desirable and I would like to thank you very much and Anastasia for giving me the opportunity to talk on the dementia in cataract surgery. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much Professor Chandra Kumar. Excellent as usual. Uh, very fine lecture one. Um, uh, let's uh, continue for sorry. Sharing. Okay. Okay. Thank you so much. Uh, let's uh, continue to our uh, third speaker today. Uh, this is uh, the third. Our third speaker, uh, speaker is Professor Ezat Aziz uh, from Egypt. 
Egypt. He will uh, present about complication of ophthalmic regional anesthesia. Uh, please, uh, time is yours, Prof. Ezad. Uh, good evening, everybody. Uh, first of all, I want to apologize because I cannot do it lively because unfortunately I have to be on the aeroplane at the time of uh, the lecture because I'm going to the UK. Uh, so I'm really sorry. Uh, again, uh, you know that in the anesthesia is part of my uh, life and uh, I hope that 2023 will be all together and we can meet each other face to face. Uh, thank you, Cecilia, for inviting me for the uh, uh, prestigious meeting that you do every year. And I'm going to talk today about complications of orbital region anesthesia. Uh, as you know, that I work now for uh, Cairo University. Uh, I worked in the UK as a consultant in Eastus for about 21 years, but now I'm full-time in Egypt, and I'm currently the president of the African Society of Regional Anesthesia, AFSR. Um, as you know, because I come from Egypt, I always um, put this lecture. This is Horus, who is the guy of protection, or the god of protection of skies. And before you prescribe any, any medications now, you just write the letter R, which is actually the eye of Horus. So Horus is the god of protection and still protecting patients for the last 7,000 years. Uh, I work, as I said now, as full-time in Cairo University Hospital, which was built in 1837. It has 6,000 beds, 3 MMR, MRIs, and 11 ICUs. It's quite a big hospital. We have a dedicated hospital for pediatrics, and this is how it looked like in 1837. And now this is the new building of Cairo University, and we have a catchment area of about 2.8 million. And this is actually my office under this dome, which is the old building built by the Brits. Uh, I'm going to talk today about orbital regional blocks. Uh, regional blocks, we can classify them into akinetic blocks and non-akinetic blocks. Akinetic blocks in which the eye does not move. The non-akinetic blocks, the eye is anesthetized, but the eye is moving. So obviously with non-akinetic blocks, the complications are much less, but you need a very cooperative patient and you need a very experienced surgeon. Sometimes when you have uh, uh, surgeons who are just beginning, you have to respect the learning curve of the surgeon and you have to use uh, needle blocks which provides the akinetic blocks. Uh, needle blocks, if you consider this the muscle cone, if you put the needle outside the muscle cone, this is what we call the extraconal or peribulbar block and if you put the needle inside the muscle cone, this is what we call the intracornal or retrobulbar block. Obviously, the intracornal or retrobulbar block are dangerous because you're very close to the optic nerve, you're very close to the blood vessels, so if you injure one of these delicate structures, you might end up with a disaster to the patients. That's why the modern teaching for needle blocks is that you have to use extracornal or peribulbar blocks. The complications of needle blocks are classified into Systemic blocks and local blocks. Systemic blocks are rare. You can have cardiorespiratory problems, CNS problems. Local blocks, if you are inexperienced and you have uncooperative patients, you can have uh, uh, these local complications. And for simplicity, I use the word ophthalmology, OPTH. O is optic nerve, P is perforation and penetration, H is hemorrhage, T is toxicity of muscles. So we'll go through these complications. The systemic complications is the oculocardic reflex. Excessive sensor stimulation by that needle or too rapid injections when you do the blocks, you might end up with oculocardic reflex. Patients will suffer from bradycardia, dysrhythmias, nausea, up to cardiac arrest. So my advice to you is when you use needle blocks, you have to be ready in case something goes wrong. You have to have your resuscitation trolley next to you. You can have your emergency medications next to you as well. The central spread of local anesthetic, this is actually a nasty complication. What's the possible mechanism? You can have here, if you inject intraconal or sub uh, um, the peribulbar block, the local anesthetic might um, 
get absorbed inside the cone and it gets absorbed with the sheath of the optic nerve and it goes to the subdural space and you end up by total spinal anesthesia. Luckily, this is not a life-threatening operation. You have to be ready for complication. You just intubate the patient and put them on a ventilator for about four to six hours. You have to reassure the family that this is uh, something not really serious, but in a matter of hours, the patient goes back to normal. Allergy estimated that 99% of adverse reactions do not involve allergic mechanisms. So it's actually not real allergy, but a systemic effect of epinephrine or vasovagal syncope. And it's, the incidence is very low, especially with the use of amide local anesthetics, which we currently use. Now we come to the local complications. As I mentioned before, it's OPHD. O is optic nerve damage. If you, you, it can be either a direct trauma to the optic nerve, you use the retrobarbar blocks. That's why I said you have to uh, avoid using retrobarbar blocks. And sometimes it happens because of increased orbital pressure in case you do retrobarbar hemorrhage. So there is tamponade over the vessels, especially in diabetics where the uh, vessels are really fragile. So you end up with optic nerve ischemic damage. Again, P is perforation. There is perforation and penetration, and the causes can be either patient factors or anesthetic factors. So let's see what is the difference between perforation and penetration. With penetration, you penetrate the globe and you inject the local anesthetic inside the globe. With perforation, you have inlet and exit. So when you inject the local anesthetic, it's outside the cone. So actually, the prognosis of penetration is worse than perforation because with penetration, as I said on the previous slide, you inject the local anesthetic inside the globe, so you end up with injury of the globe. Perforation happens for patient factors and anesthetic factors. I'm going to start with anesthetic factors. If you're inexperienced enough, okay, and you have inadequate knowledge of the anatomy of the globe and the orbit, you might end up with inattention to details and you can end up with disasters. You have to have quite a, a t proper teaching, okay, and you have to have a good, poor, uh, good eye hand coordinations to avoid perforation and penetration of the globe. Patient factors, you perform a needle block in patients that you should not do. Uh, I need a block. So uh, patients with long axial length, patients with staphyloma, so you, you, the orbit, the globe itself is fragile. Okay, so these patients you have to avoid using uh, needle blocks and you end up with subtenon block. The consequences is vitreous hemorrhage, macular destruction, optic nerve damage, retinal det detachment, and visual disruption, and might end up with even no light perception. So imagine a patient coming for cataract surgery, he's looking forward that he will, his eyesight will improve, and because you did the complications as perforation, you end up with a blind eye at the end, so this is really a serious complications. How to diagnose this? There's early diagnosis and late diagnosis. With early diagnosis, there is hypotony and pain during needle insertion. Of course, when you inject the local anesthetic, there is pain, okay? But if you perforate the globe or you penetrate the globe, the pain is really severe. It's not like the pain of the injection. And late complications, vitreous and anterior chamber hemorrhage, there is loss of red uh, reflex. So it's just actually very common that if you perforate or penetrate the globe, you get the patient inside theater. As soon as the surgeon sits on the microscope, he will tell you, I cannot see the red reflex. The strategies for prevention is that you have to stay away from the globe. You have to know your anatomy very well. You have to study the patient's eye because every patient has a different eye. Okay? Not all the eyes are the same. And you have to have the proper technique and the good technique for the patient. The anatomical knowledge that uh, you have to know that the globe is slightly closer to the roof than the floor, and the globe is slightly closer to the lateral than the medial wall. So it means that if you want to inject with a needle, you have to do it on the floor of the orbit, not the floor. Uh, uh, sorry, the floor, not the roof, and if you inject, you have to inject uh, in the medial wall rather than the lateral wall. 
This shows the, the, the length between the front of the globe and the back of the globe, and it's around 42 millimeters. So obviously, the shorter the needle you use, the less complications that can happen. So uh, we used to teach 35 millimeters, then it dropped to now 1.5 centimeters, 15 millimeter. So with a 15 millimeter or 1.5 centimeter, you can have a very proper block and you have to avoid the complications of the needle blocks. The other thing is that you have to know the patient's eye, okay? You have to know the axial length. So if the patient comes for cataract surgery, look at the sonography and it's written the axial length. If the axial length is 26, 27, 29 millimeter, this is a big eye and the incidence of perforation and penetration is um, uh, higher. So you have to be very careful when you do any block with these patients. The other thing, it's not only the axial length of the patient, it's the globe orbit relationship because you might have a big globe in a big orbit. So the space between the globe and orbit is sufficient enough to insert needles. So this is not very dangerous. You have to study the degree of proptosis or the deep set eyes, the level of cooperation of the patient, how anxious the patient is, okay? There's history of staphyloma, there is history of prior uh, retina surgery. All these things end up in uh, a difficult block and the incidence of complications will be more. So the take-home messages, never use needle longer than 31 mm. In fact, you use 1.5 to 2 centimeters now, not even 31. And if you use the medial blocks, I think 25 mm is more than enough. That thing is they have to forget about the lateral third and the medial two-third rule. Now we inject as far lateral as possible to avoid uh, injection in the muscles. Uh, Never put the needle in the superior nasal quadrant because there's two um, delicate structures over there. So better to use the inferior and the medial injections and always examine the eye carefully and study the orbit globe relationship for each patient. Now we come to the H, hemorrhage. It can be either venous or arterial. Obviously, if you have a venous hemorrhage, the slow is very, the onset is very slow, and you have arterial. It's very fast onset, okay, and you might have increase in the intraocular pressure to the point that you might use a canthotomy, and you, you do it with scissors just to relieve the pressures on the globe. Otherwise, you might end up with a disaster on, of the patient's eye. It's minimized by rapid application of this pressure over the gazed uh, pad on the closed leads. And as I said, to avoid it, use the two gates that are avascular, which is the infratemporal and nasal. Try to avoid the superior nasal, and one gate is avascular, is vascular, which is the superior nasal, and this is the one I, I really would like you that you don't use it except when it's absolutely necessary. T is toxicity of ocular muscles. Um, if you inject local anesthetic inside the extraocular muscle, you will get myotoxic paresis. So patients in the post period will suffer from diplopia or ptosis. It's prevented by avoiding higher concentration of lidocaine and the use of extreme lateral inferior injection away from the oblique muscles so that you avoid injection, direct injection of local anesthetic inside the extraocular muscles. Um, now we come to the subtenon block. As I said, the subtenon block that you use a cannula, so it's not a sharp needle, so the complications are much less. You can have minor complications, which happens more or less common, and major complications, luckily, they are not common at all. The pain during injection, the instance is high, up to 50%. And uh, because you are dissecting, you use cannulas, and if you use posterior cannulas, which are the longer ones, the incidence of pain is much more. Is it the local anesthetic? As you know, that local anesthetic stinge. So it could be the pain of stinging local anesthetic. How to avoid this complication is to use smaller cannulas, slower injections, and warm your local anesthetic. As you know, especially if you work in uh, hot countries like Indonesia or Egypt, you always put the local anesthetic inside the fridges. And uh, if you inject something cold, it really hurts. So usually I take off the local anesthetic outside the fridge so that it gets to room temperature and body temperature. Um, another complication that can happen with subtenon is conjunctival hemorrhage. 
It happens up to 20% when you sever small blood vessels and may spread to other quadrants. So you do the block here, you might have the local the bleeding going to the medial quarter here. How to prevent it? Use smaller volume, use epinephrine, and dithermy doesn't really help. Chemosis, it happens in 20% even in best hands, okay? Because sometimes you do the dissection inadequately. So there is a spread of local anesthetic under the conjunctiva. This is what's called chemosis, and it's always volume related. So if you use smaller volumes, you get less chemosis, but the problem that your block might not be uh, appropriate, so you have to balance between chemosis and the volume of local anesthetic they use. The more experienced you are, you can do the block with lesser uh, volume. But with um, subtenum block, you always have a bit of globe and lid mobility. But of course, with the experienced surgeon, this really doesn't really matter, okay? Uh, it's volume dependent. Usually the superior oblique is relatively active because the nerve of the superior oblique comes behind the muscle cone and lid movement is usually present. Uh, loss of blood anesthetic during injection, this is a minor problem that can happen, especially with the inexperienced anesthetist, because he's a bit afraid to do dissection properly. So if you do inadequate dissection of the thin capsule, um, the spread of blood anesthetic comes outside the capsule, and it's more frequent with shorter cannulas. Okay? So how to prevent this? You have to do proper dissection and always have more local anesthetic in hands in case you think that the block is not uh, good enough so you can inject more. Major complications, luckily it's only case reports, okay? And it's reported with the use of posterior cannulas. As I said, if you use anterior cannulas, the shorter the needles, the lesser the complication, okay? This is one of the take home messages, either with uh, the cannula or with the needle. So you can have orbital retrobulbar hemorrhage, superior oblique paresis, globe perforation, optic neuropathy, diplopia, retinal choroidal vascular occlusion, dilated pupils. The two things that really uh, happens with case reports is orbital cellulitis and central spread. Let's see what are these two complications. With orbital cellulitis, there is infection. Okay, It can be either infection or allergy to the local anesthetic or the hyalase enzyme that you use. Okay? And especially when you use excessive dose, you will get what we call pseudotumors. How to prevent this? You have to use antiseptic solution, no touch technique, and if you think that orbit is established, try to use antibiotic and steroids as quick as possible. The other thing is the central spread of local aesthetic. Okay, even though you are using a subtenon, but you can have spread of the local aesthetic via the uh, subdura, okay, and you end up with total spinal anesthesia, like uh, what I mentioned with uh, the needle blocks. The advantages of subtenon that you avoid sharp needles, it's safe in anticoagulated patients, as you know, that most of the patients, they have, they are elderly, they have AF, so and usually an anticoagulant, so it is safe uh, to use, to use this block with anticoagulated patients. The other thing, that most of these patients as well, they are osteoarthritic, they are on non-steroidus for joint pains, and this is safe as well with subtenin block. So actually subtenin block is the popular block that we are using nowadays. You can use subtenin blocks on almost all surgeries that you know. So it's the cataract surgery, trabeculectomy, vitreoretin surgery, and even squint surgery you can use subtenin block. So in fact, subtenin block can be even used for postoperative analgesia with skin surgery. So after you use, uh, you do your skin surgery, you ask the surgeon to inject some local anesthetic before he, uh, closing the, the sheath around the muscles, and it actually provides very good uh, postoperative analgesia as well. I thank you so much, and I hope to see you soon in uh, 2023. I really miss you all, guys. And I'm sorry again that I couldn't be with you lively because of this sudden uh, traveling that I had to do to the UK on Saturday. Thank you so much indeed, and I will see you soon. Okay.
Uh, thank you so much. That's a very nice presentation from uh, the Professor Ezad Aziz. Um, I think uh, there is no time left. Uh, but before I close this meeting, let me read the conclusion of uh, this session. Uh, the first one is about uh, anesthesia for strabismus surgery. Uh, we might conclude that the type of anesthesia given must be tailored with the type of uh, strabismus surgery and patient condition. And general anesthesia is suitable for all kinds of surgery. And regional anesthesia can reduce oculocardiac reflex and emergence agitation and prophylactic antiemetic and multimodal analgesia combined with regional anesthesia can be given. And for the second session from Professor Chandra Kumar, we can conclude that dementia is a growing problem in ophthalmic anesthesia and uh, cataract surgery for dementia patient will be more common in the future. And until now, there is no specific type of anesthesia that is superior for this population. And for the third session, we can see that uh, Prof. Eza say that uh, there is several take-home message for several type of uh, anesthesia for uh, regional uh, anesthesia that can we we can uh, shorten it with uh, OPHT. I think that's all the conclusion. Um, thank you so much, Prof. Chandra Kumar for a very nice lecture and very fruitful one. Thank you so much, Alfred. Uh, very nice and also very fruitful one. Thank you, brother. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And I give it. Okay. I hope that we can meet next year. Uh, I give it back to Krisha. Okay. Thank you, Dr. Aida, for moderating this session. Uh, once again, I would like to thank uh, Prof. Chandra and Alfred. Thank you very much for giving up your time. Uh, very nice to see you. Hopefully next year, who knows, we can see each other again offline. <laughs> Finger crossed. <laughs> stay safe. Uh, stay healthy.